Hello, everyone. This is the CircuitPython weekly meeting for Monday, May 22nd, 2023. This is the time of week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Paul Cutler, and I'm a member of the CircuitPython community. What is CircuitPython? CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, considering, consider purchasing your hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafruit.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except where it coincides with a U.S. holiday like it will next week, where we'll have the meeting on Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern due to the Memorial Day ho holiday in the U.S. In the notes doc, there is a link to a calendar you can view online or add it to your favorite calendar app. We'll also, consider, we'll also continue to send notifications in Discord. There's a notes document to accompany the meeting and recording. The final notes document includes timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the doc to skip around and view the parts of the video that interest you the most. The meeting tends to run 45 to 60 minutes. After each meeting, we post a link for next week's meeting notes document in the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. Check the pinned messages to find the latest notes doc so you can add your notes for the following meeting. If you wish to participate but cannot, cannot attend, you can leave hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read during the meeting. This meeting is held in five parts. The first part is community news. This is a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a preview of our Python microcontrollers newsletter. The second part is the state of CircuitPython, libraries, and Blinka. This is a quantitative overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers separate from our status updates. The third part is hug reports. Hug reports are an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, taking the time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. The fourth part is status updates. S status updates is an opportunity to report on what we've been up to. Take a couple of minutes and talk about what you've been doing in the last week since the last meeting and what you'll be up to over the next week. The fifth and last part is in the weeds. In the weeds is an opportunity for more long form discussions. These discussions can come out of status updates or be something you've identified ahead of time as too long for status updates. And that's how the meeting will go. With that, I'll get started with community news. Um, I thought we'd start with the project of the week. It's an assistive project, which I love. It's called Reviving the Assistive Technology QuinKey and MicroWriter Keypads. Quirky is a circuit Python code for the PyPico version of the QuinKey keyboard based heavily on the work done by MicroWriter. The device emulates a USB HID US keyboard and requires no specific drivers. It does, however, need the Adafruit HID circuit Python libraries, which can be downloaded from a Adafruit's HID example web web page on GitHub. It now also includes a simple typing tutor application. And if you click through the MicroWriter link, um, the MicroWriter and QuinKey were six key chord keyboards created in the 80s for use by people with various physical limitations such as brittle bones. They developed a following among all types of users being simple, reliable, easy to use, and effectively allowed instant touch typing at speed. They also connected via an RS-232 serial port to a tape deck so you could load and save um, what you were typing as well, which is kind of cool, or a BBC Micro. Um, the next project is a DIY circular sequencer made with Raspberry Pi Pico and CircuitPython and some Neop NeoPixel rings. I thought that's interesting with all the SynthIO stuff going out. Here's a MIDI project that might tie into it. And then lastly is a review of MicroPython 1.20 from LWN.net. Um, they provide a thorough review of the latest MicroPython release 1.20. And they go on to say, for those looking for an easy way to program microcontrollers, MicroPython has much to offer. Together with alternatives like Adafruit's MicroPython fork CircuitPython and the education focus Sneak, or Snake, I'm not sure, it shows that Python has a place in the embedded world. The closest competitor for microcontroller development, Arduino, requires at least some knowledge of C++, but Python is generally easier to pick up. Moreover, as the WebAssembly port and its use as a smaller and faster PyScript runtime shows, MicroPython seems to be well-suited for other constrained environments as well. 
This and more is available in our weekly Python for Microcontrollers newsletter, which goes out via email on Tuesday mornings. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe to the newsletter. Thanks to Anne for putting the newsletter together. And if you have any Python on hardware projects to share or find content you'd like to see included, please consider contributing to the newsletter. You can open a PR on GitHub, you can tag at an underscore engineer on Twitter with hashtag CircuitPython or use the same hashtag on Mastodon as well. All right, with that, we will move on to the state of CircuitPython libraries and Blinkas in Blinka. This is a quantitative overview of the entire project. It gives us a chance to look at the health of our project separate from our status updates. We'll talk about the project overall, then separately discuss the core libraries and Blinka. Um, overall, we had 22 pull requests merged from 18 authors, which is great to see. Some that were new to me are Louis San00, Aaron GD, XGQFRMS, and R. Carteras. I apologize if I pronounced any of those wrong. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to Scott for the core. Hello. Okay, numbers for the core. Um, this is like the C core of CircuitPython. Uh, we have th 13 pull requests merged from 13 different authors, uh, which is more than normal, which is great. So thank you to all of our authors. In addition, we had six reviewers for those 13 pull requests. So thank you to our six reviewers. This is also a higher number than normal. So thank you to those folks as well. Uh, we have 25 open pull requests. Uh, a bunch of those are really young. So uh, it looks like eight are three days or newer, uh, which is awesome. Um, so we are you know, well under our my, my one page of pull request gut check limit. Um, issues wise, we had 13 closed issues by eight people and 13 opens by 12 people. So a good number of people involved and uh, a net zero uh, issue count, which is great. For a total of 644 open issues, um, we have eight active milestones. These are used to kind of prioritize Adafruit-funded folks' work. Um, we have zero open issues for both 80X and 810. So uh, I suspect Dan will be releasing 81 soon. Um, 33 open issues for 8XX and then 29 for 9.0. So we're we're getting closer and closer to that corner where we're turning into 9.0 land. Um, and 545 total uh, long-term issues. So these are issues that uh, we may need more information on or they're just not a priority, priority for Adafruit. Um, feel free to pick those up if you find them and want to work on them. Uh, but those are not something that we imminently will be working on uh, as, as Adafruit funded folks. Um, last up, we had six issues not assigned a milestone. This is just to gauge uh, how well we're doing in triaging issues as they come in. Um, and so we'll have to take a look at that. And that number is probably lower because it's Monday morning. So uh, likely get to those as well, but always good to check. And that's it for the core. Thanks, Scott. Kenny, will you go over the libraries? Absolutely. This section applies to uh quite a few repositories. It is all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that starts with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, as well as our cookie cutter and our uh, community bundle. So over all of those repos, we had nine pull requests merged from seven different authors and seven reviewers. Um, we have uh, currently 71 open pull requests, which is surprisingly high. Um, highest it's been in a long time this is absolutely fine because like i said this is over something like 400 uh three to 400 repositories um and uh, in terms of issues we had two closed issues by two people and 10 open by seven people leaving us with 622 open issues and 52 of those are labeled good first issue if you're interested in contributing to circuit python on the python side of things check out circuitpython.org contributing You'll find all of this information and more, including open pull requests and open issues. Uh, if you're interested in contributing by reviewing, check out the open pull requests. If you're interested in contributing by submitting uh, code or documentation, um, check out the open issues. If you're new to everything uh, in terms of contributing uh, code or documentation, uh, we have a guide on um, 
we have a guide on contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub, which I'm realizing actually has a whole two sections on reviewing as well. So regardless of how you want to contribute, check out this guide. Um, and we're always available on Discord to help you out. In terms of library PyPI weekly download stats, uh, we had uh, total download stats for the week were 168,523 over 310 libraries. And um, the top 10 downloads are in the list. If you're interested, they are in the notes document. In terms of library updates in the last seven days, we had one new library uh, by Jose David called CircuitPython BMA220. And we had five updated libraries that are in the um, that are in the uh, notes as well, but um, I will not read them off. And that's where we are with the libraries. Thanks, Katni. Melissa, will you go over Blinka? Uh, yes. Um, so for Blinka, we had, uh, which is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for uh, MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. Um, this week, uh, I lost. Uh, this week we had zero pull requests merged, uh, and there are currently three open pull requests amongst the repositories. There were zero closed issues and one open by one person, leaving a net of 97 open issues. There were 14,169 PyPI downloads in the last week, 8,569 PyWheels downloads in the last month, and we are at 119 boards. You'll notice it may it slipped back one board, and that's because um, one of the 120 boards was actually added in accidentally, and it was actually a circuit Python board only. And uh, that's it. Thank you so much, Melissa. Next up is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is a chance to highlight folks in the circuit Python community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start, and then we'll go down the list alphabetically to give everyone a chance to participate. If you are text only or are missing the meeting, I'll read your notes when I get them, get to them in the list. And first up, I have a group hug for everybody. And up next is Dan H. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks to you, Paul, for your professional interview of me for the Circuit Python show. That's coming out today. I'll give a little plug, but it was a real pleasure to do that interview, and it came out great with sort of invisible edits that made it sound better is exactly what should be done. Um, thanks to Jeff for uh, his continuing inspired SynthIO um, capabilities. This whole thing is really on a roll and it's really turning out fantastically. And thanks to Charlie Zero Hotel, or no, Charlie H0, H0 Hotel, um, R. Carter AZ and Bab Bablock B, and other maybe other people for third party board PRs. This is true every week. We just seem to have more this week. We really appreciate people who are working on third party boards because we don't have them available to test. But uh, we appreciate them being added to the CircuitPython ecosystem. Thanks, Dan. Up next is DJ okay. Evan 3. Uh, thank you. I'd like to send a hug to Foamy Guy for helping me format a rounding function using F strings and for the educational stream on SD card, SD card core coding uh, that I will probably never understand. Uh, hug to JP for a synthtacular episode this week. It was circuit bending perfection with the Metro M7 and a neat IDC punch down connector. Uh, thank you, or a hug to Anecdata for the advice to use storage U-mount instead of trying to race a sleep timer Mission Impossible style, removing and returning the SD card between file writes. A hug to Tyeth and Spoblot for helping with MQTT and Adafruit IO. Are you really learning anything unless you fail in every possible way first? I failed a lot. I learned a lot about MQTT this week. Thank you very both very much. And to Paul Cutler for a great interview of Dan H. I already uh, listened to that one uh, this morning. It was That was great. So that's it. Thanks, DJ Devin3. Foamy Guy, you're up next. All righty, thank you. Um, hug reports this week. Thank you to uh, Neradoc, who has a uh, CircuitPython web sockets library on GitHub, which has proven to be quite helpful to me this week. Um, so thank you for that. And then uh, hug report also uh, to all of uh, Jeff, Dan, uh, Mark Ambler, Bill88T, and uh, Deshipu, all of whom 
uh, pointed me in various correct directions on things I was looking at inside the core over the past couple of days, and I appreciate all of it. Thanks. Thanks, homie guy. Jepler, what have you got going on? Hello. Hello. Uh, I have some hug reports for Mark Gambler, for uh, John Park, and for Toddbot for the continued SynthIO feedback. And thank you to you, Paul, for hosting today. We're really happy to see you back in the role. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate that. Uh, Jose David is next. He's out, out missing the meeting today. I'll read for him. He has a hug report for C. Grover for the elegant and useful color fader library. And with that, Katni, you're up. Thanks. So first up, I have a super hug to Tectric for updating the CI setup on our learning system guides repository to only run the licensing and pilot checks when Python code is submitted, when only Python code is submitted. It was previously building literally every Arduino project in that entire repository for every PR. Um, Python PRs are now down to three minutes from over an hour, sometimes up to two, and this is going to save so much time and it makes so much more sense. And it's something I've wanted for a very long time and finally got the okay to do it. And, uh, Tectric, uh, whipped that up and I'm very excited. Um, to hug report to Noah for his thoughts on my code, which led to me to change some things to make it much better. To Dan for a ton of help with my code, including making all the right things user customizable and helping simplify bits that I didn't know could be simplified. To Jeff for almost always being available to help with arbitrary code questions when I have them. To Naradoc, Anik Data, Bill88T, and Mark Gambler for a great discussion on the many ways that you can reset or reload your board from code. I wasn't thinking about it broadly enough, and I was thinking there were really only two. To Phil for a quick exchange about loading my upcoming Canary Nightlight guide with maybe not so oblique references to the lyrics from They Might Be Giants Birdhouse in Your Soul and verifying that my plan to do that and including attribution were completely fine. To Liz for offering to do up fritzing objects until I figured out getting it working on my new laptop and for creating the fritzing object I needed for my next guide on my list. Um, hugs to other folks that I almost certainly missed and a group hug. Thanks, Katni. Maker Melissa, you're next. Hello. Um, so I wanted to give a hug to uh, Tectric for updating the Learning Guide CI to be much faster. Uh, everyone who contributed to the discussion about changing over from Jekyll to an alternative site generator, including Danu, uh, Dan, and Justin, and a group hug to everyone else. Thanks, Melissa. Next up is Mark Gambler 21. He has a hug report for Jepler for more SynthIO work that has led me down a path of learning about synths. And a hug for Toddbot and John Park for answering and confirming random synth things I find along the way. And with that, Scott, it's your turn. Thanks, Paul. Um, OK, so first, a uh, hug to TAC for working on IMX USB host again. Uh, I had tried it, and it wasn't working, so I kind of Toss the ball to TAC to take a look at it again, and they made a PR to my stuff that I will get back to today, and hopefully we'll have some more USB host work on IMX done. Uh, and then in the same vein as Dan, uh, TK Roo for Lolan Board Defs, thank you, and also to Charlie Hotel for IMX 1060 EVKB board definition in addition to the regular EVK. Uh, thanks to those folks for making board defs. Thanks, Scott. And last up is Toddbot, who has hugs for Jepler for all the cool synth.io work, LFOs, maths, filters, and last to Gambler Mark for deeper synth.io testing that I, than I currently have brain for. And with that, we'll move on to status updates. Status updates is our time to tell folks what we're up to individually. I'll start, and we'll go through the list alphabetically. When I call on you, take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you'll be doing until the next meeting. This is also an opportunity to provide tips and tricks rele relevant to what people are working on. If a discussion becomes too long for status updates, we can move it to in the weeds. Um, last week, I edited both episodes for June with guests Martin Tan and Aaron St. Blaine, so that was nice to have those done and out of the way. And today we've got a new episode out with Dan H. talking all things CircuitPython. Thanks again for being on the show. And with that, it's, it is Dan H.'s turn. 
Okay, thanks. Um, so I released 810, Circuit Python 810, released candidate zero last week. Um, nobody, no showstoppers showed up for that. Um, so we decided in the internal meeting that we'll go ahead and release th that as it stands as 810 final because we really need an 810 release. There's a bunch of stuff that could really use a labeled release, some guides that depend on it and things like that. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that's still outstanding. Um, and that could that will be in in 811 or even an 820 release. Um, as we always say, release numbers are free. They're cheap. There's a large supply of integers. Uh, so some things that will be in the next release after this, um, I added alarm.sleep memory for RP2040. Kind of because somebody uh, got provoked to do it by somebody saying, "How come it's not there?" And it turned out it was really easy to add. Uh, I fixed um, expressive touch alarm, which had been broken since seven two zero, so that's also not something that's urgent. And uh, there's a bunch of board updates, and there's the synthio stuff, and there's some various other things, and all that can go in the next release after eight one zero. We don't really need to hold up the current release for that. So that's the plan. So you'll see an 810 today, I think, if I get to it. Okay. Thanks, Dan. DJ Devin 3, what have you got going on? Uh, not much. Uh, I went on show and tell this week with my custom 19 inch NeoPixel Ring PCB. Uh, I'm still working on the motor and code for the NeoPixel Lazy Susan. The PCBs and the animations running on them work well. I continued calibrating the BME 280 sensor bias adjustment script. It's now 99.5% accurate, up 4% uh, or 0.4% um, compared against a NIST traceable mercury thermometer and NOAA data. And this is a bias offset um, adjustment for the BME 280 uh, proof, because if you count the little blocks, you can see it's actually raising up temperature. Um, I connected uh, my Feather Weather Station to Adafruit I.O. using MQTT, mini MQTT this week. It's now automatically plotting the bias adjustment data points so that because I was writing, literally writing them down. Uh, so I automated that. Um, and I'm still hoping to improve it to 99.9% .9 accurate this summer, which might allow me to like say it's uh, associated with a NIST traceable. It, it's like this whole thing, but it's that's really cool. So I'm really excited to work on the weather stuff. Like, I love that stuff. Uh, I modified a bitmap saver script to unmount the SD card after taking a screenshot of the display without worrying about file corruption. Submitted PRs to update the library examples using U-mount. If file corruption happens, the only way to fix it is to reformat the SD card. And I have experienced that in the past because it doesn't use U-mount. Um, so hopefully this will save someone from that mistake in the future. And that's all I got. Thank you. Homie guy, it's your turn. All right. Um, over the past week or so, I worked on, uh, I attempted, I should say, to uh, make a custom build that would initialize the SD card, a built-in SD card on a particular device, and mount it inside of the core in the board init function. Uh, I am, have been unsuccessful so, so far, but I've received some tips uh, on ways to get output for more uh, troubleshooting. So I kind of have in mind what the next steps would be uh, if I do keep digging on that. Uh, but I have also started to rethink a bit whether it will be as helpful as I initially thought um, to have the SD card get initialized inside the core. Um, my Current thinking is more along the lines of just initializing it, grabbing what I need, and then deinitializing it immediately so it spends most of its time uh, not initialized instead of the opposite. Um, but I'm not 100% decided one way or another yet on uh, in my particular use case, which will make the most sense. Um, over the past weekend, I had some fun with a, a little project. I was implementing the encryption logic that was inside the Enigma machine uh, that was used in World War II. Uh, there are some existing implementations of uh, both Python and other languages. Those were pretty helpful to look at, but I decided to build one up from scratch because I was having trouble understanding some of the ways that it worked, and this gave me a much better idea since I was forced to learn it in order to write the code. Uh, mine is functional, but it's not fully accurate yet. 
uh, if your message is over a certain length, then it won't come out as the same message that would be produced by the real machine. Um, that's because my rotor advancement logic needs some help. Um, I am thinking about making this, once it, once it does function correctly uh, all the way, I'm thinking about making this into a macro pad project, which would allow the macro pad device to act in a similar capacity as the original machine. So the user could use that macro pad to encrypt or decrypt messages by inputting it into the device. Uh, although obviously the macro pad would not have the full keyboard uh, like the original machine did. Um, so that may be coming soon. Um, Outside of CircuitPython world, uh, at least sort of, uh, I've been spending some time at my other job working on using the Pimeroni Inky Frame device as a digital signage player that would be used for displaying pricing or other information. Uh, in the process, I have submitted a couple of tweaks to the request library as well as the community WebSockets library uh, that I ended up needing in order to interact with the server um, that is being used in that case. Uh, it's only happened for me a few times so far, but it's always uh, a really nice time when my uh, other kind of professional world intersects with uh, CircuitPython, so I can spend some time uh, at work doing some of this stuff as well. Um, for the uh, upcoming week and uh, today as well, I've gotten started. I'm doing reviews on uh, libraries, in particular the ePaper display and the HTTP server library. Um, I've been doing some testing on both of those, and to go along with the HTTP server library this afternoon, I'll be working on some updates that will be needed in Learn Guides and any other example code that does use HTTP server, since the API is changing a little bit in this uh, PR, so we'll need to make those changes in a few other places. Um, and that's what I have got going on. Thanks. Thanks, Foamy Guy. And I'll turn it over to Jepler. Hello again. So my main focus right now is really trying to wrap up SynthIO. I added a bunch of tests today, and they all look good in local testing, although they're failing in the CI, so I'll have to take a look at that. I uh, also uh, want to just appreciate again the positive feedback from Todd Bot, who was kicking the tires. I marked the pull request as ready for technical review, so that's uh, an exciting step. I still need to test on more different microcontroller chips and get an idea of what does and doesn't work. So I'm going to test on SAMD51, which back in April worked. Um, I'm going to test on NRF52840, which back in April was not working so well, and on the ESP32S3, which I haven't tried to, yet. And uh, just a heads up, this uh, current pull request is not going to be an 810 final if it goes out um, on the schedule Dan was thinking of. And that means there will be incompatible changes to SynthIO in 811 or 820, which um, is, quote, okay, because the module is marked experimental in the documentation. I was looking at my old draft PRs, and I closed two of them as out of date. In one case, Liz had done uh, the work in a separate PR, so thank you, Liz. And um, in the other case, that specific hardware isn't going to be manufactured, so I closed it as moot. This week, I need to make the successor to one of those uh, pull requests, which is to add the Matrix Portal ESP32-S3 board definition. And a subtask of that, or a related task, is to make the Matrix Portal CircuitPython library uh, work transparently with it and with the original Matrix Portal. And if I don't get to that myself, I will file an issue about it. Um, coming up in the future after that will be the SynthIO guide. And then I've been doing CPM for fun times, and I will possibly do a CPM-related guide in the future. I ran into somebody who has done a port of CPM that runs in an RP2040, and wouldn't it be cool to show that off, maybe add a little um, exciting functionality that's not in the upstream project, and uh, put that out for the world on Learn. That would be super fun. Anyway, and I will be out on Friday, but uh, I'll be around most of the rest of the week. So if you're looking for help, just you know mention me on the public channels, and I'll see you all around. Thanks, Jepler. Katni? Hello. So last week, uh, my new laptop's first day at work was last Monday. Um, fought with one work-related tool for four days, but in the end managed to uber kludge it and got it working. Uh, for the most part, otherwise, it's simply been um, installing apps that I use as I need them instead of just copying everything over, obviously, from the previous machine. But it's been running great. Um, I haven't had any issues. 
and I'm really happy with it. Um, so otherwise, I was focused on the Canary Nightlight project. The code is in a great place. There's a lot to customize if you desire, and it's very readable. After switching to the ESP32 S3, it's running without issues for days. The guide is probably, my part of the guide anyway, is probably three quarters done. Um, as a aside, I added a short section on RGB colors with regards to NeoPixels uh, or LEDs in general in the NeoPixel Uber guide. So I can link to it from project guides. Um, it's really good info. It, it, it explains basically what color tuples are, what they look like and what they mean, and then gives a list of, you know, eight basic uh, colors that one might use. Um, and it's in uh, all of the development board guides as a in the NeoPixel template, but I didn't want to link to an arbitrary board guide from a project guide. And so I talked to uh, Phil B, who is the author of the NeoPixel Uber guide, and we figured out a good place for it. And now that's there. And this week, uh, the Canary Guide need to finish up the code walkthrough and then uh, complete the overview from start to finish. Um, once that's done, I will be picking up something else from my quite lengthy list. I'm not sure what yet, though, because I've been focused on the Canary. Um, and that's what I've got. Thanks, Katni. And Maker Melissa, it's your turn. Uh, yeah, uh, so last week I updated the circuitpython.org website and fixed a board that was showing up with an incorrect photo and name. And I also added a section to the board check to make sure that uh, Blinka boards have the Blinka flag set. Uh, so circuitpython boards aren't accidentally copied over, uh, as was the case with one of the boards. Uh, I worked on adding some uh, more requested features to the storybook collaboration project with Aaron and worked on finding a way to reduce the uh, ALSA error messages. That's the advanced Linux sound architecture. Um, messages that speech recognition was displaying. I also wrote the listener library for the uh, project, which works much better than the original version. And I worked on writing up the project guide and added the set of instructions for the project. Uh, this week, uh, I need to, I'm working on finishing up the guide, then I'll possibly uh, do some research for changing the circuitpython.org website to a new, a new site generator that's easier to work with, or I may possibly work on the circuitpython code editor to fix some bugs. Um, and that's where I'm at. Thanks, Melissa. Scott. Hello. Um, I worked all last week on <clears throat> an SWD flasher library. Um, it's inspired by both PyOCD and Adafruit DAP. Um, this is kind of in the vein of like the Circuit Pirate stuff. Um, but the the basic goal is like being able to recover SAMD 21s, 51s, and NRF 52840s if somehow the bootloader gets host. Um, so there's two pieces to this puzzle. There's a higher level MCU flasher. Uh, that is the thing that uh, knows how to flash a particular chip. And then there's debug probe, which is the lower level um, talk SWD to the device that you're talking to. And it's just using, it's doing bit banging. So it's just digital lot in outs, um, which means that it works on anything um, that runs the CircuitPython API, which uh, is, I think, the power of it. It is not that fast um, to do like a meg of flash on the NRF. It was taking me like three minutes. Um, but if you're doing like an 8K SAMD21 or a 16K SAMD51, it can be like, you know, a few seconds, which is pretty awesome. Um, and it can do like the, the boot protection and that sort of stuff too. So um, I got that working. It needs a little more polish. Um, Oh, I should say the debug probe, the API it presents is the same as PyOCD, which is kind of like OpenOCD, but all in Python. Um, and the idea there is that you should be able to use MCU flasher stuff on top of PyOCD from your desktop as well. Um, they have like JLink support, for example. So I'm going to play around with that today or tomorrow um, just to make sure that that, that does actually work. Um, I want to make more examples, and I need to reorganize the examples right now because the MCU flasher has kind of helpers for reading bin files and hex files. 
Um, the hex files are great because hex files will allow you to like skip around in the address space, address space for what you want to flash, which can make it faster. Um, beware if anybody's trying this that it does erase the entire chip, so make sure you back up uh, if you do give it a shot. Um, I've had this like Stemma G0 board design for a while, and I wanted to get that working, and I finally realized that I had SW clock and SWDIO swapped. Um, and so I, I ordered V2 of that from JLC PCB on Friday. So this would be a cool way to recover those as well. Um, I haven't done the I squared C bootloading yet, but, um, I'm still kind of thinking over this project in my mind. Um, so I'm working on the SWD stuff mostly, um, but I also, Tack got back to me and said that he had fixed USB host on IMX. So I'm going to take a look at that today and and see how far I can get with that as well. Great, thanks, Scott. Last up is Toddbot, who is lurking. He has a new Pico Step Knobs board coming from FabSoon for increased SynthIO madness. Did you know that simultaneous stereo IDA-S outputs work? Quadraphonic. And working on a couple of SynthIO examples for MacroPad RP2040 and MacroPad SynthPlug. And that wraps up status reports. Next up is In the Weeds. In the Weeds is an opportunity for long form discussions that either come out of status updates or that folks have identified um, ahead of time. We don't have any topics today, so I'll move to wrap up. This has been the CircuitPython Weekly Meeting for Monday, May 22nd, 2023. Thank you to everyone who participated. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, and those that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. Video, the video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash adafruit, and the podcast will be available on all major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held next Tuesday, May 30th at 2 p.m. Eastern due to the Memorial Day holiday here in the U.S. The meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord server, which you can join by going to adafruit.it slash discord. To be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPythonista's role on Discord. We hope to see you all next week. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>